Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining our artist panel tonight. We have Olu, Pahua, and Mia, who will be sharing their journey so far as emerging artists. This will be a casual conversation for us to learn about their journeys, um, their expectations, and their goals, and also for us to kind of talk about what's happening in the community and how we can support each other better as emerging artists, but also just um, as community artists in general. Um, and with that, I am your host, Mai, and also... Uh, I'm Benny, your co-host. All right, so tell us about yourself. Uh, what's the work that you do? Dang, I don't know if, I, if I'm ready to go first, but I'm sitting next to you, so I feel like <laughs> I'll start. <laughs> uh, my name is Nia Navarro. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I, am, I was born in Mexico, and I migrated to Minnesota in 2005, and I've been living in Minnesota ever since. I was South Minneapolis raised, and I now live in St. Paul. Um, I'm queer, non-binary, millennial, Mexican. Um, I am a community organizer, uh, but I'm also a filmmaker. Um, and uh, it's a path that I've discovered has uh, a lot of intersections between being able to uh, bring people together through the power of stories and realizing uh, just how much we have in common. Mm -hmm. well, um, hard to follow up, but <laughs> my name is Paula Zong, and I'm a Hmong American woman. I use your pronouns. I'm actually originally from California, but I moved here four years ago for college and plan to stay here um, for a little bit longer. I'm currently in St. Paul. Right now I'm doing full-time um, brand design work for uh, a company in Minneapolis, but. On the side, I like to do some freelancing, graphic design, do a lot of various things, um, mostly branding though. But besides that, I really try to think of myself as a creative problem solver. There's a lot that goes into graphic design, and yeah, I'm just excited to talk about it. Hi, hello. My name's Olu. Uh, I'm a Nigerian American, so I moved here when I was 11. Uh, I'd say I'm a, a filmmaker, but I also do a lot of photography, so I started as a photographer and eventually slowly fell down the rabbit hole and just got more into video. Uh, yeah, I have experience like shooting documentaries. I worked a little bit as like a photojournalist, like in the news, like shooting like fires and like just really wild things. But now I'm gradually as like a freelance videographer, just working on short documentaries, music videos, and trying to get my foot in the door and like collaborating. And I see like video and arts and photography as a way of just like building community and as a way of like telling stories of individuals who are not necessarily, people don't necessarily tell the stories. And it's also really just a fun way to like tap in with like your inner child, like when you're on the set, just with different people, you can play around with different ideas and just, it's very free form and like abstract and it's a space where you can heal and grow. So, yeah. Yeah, so we have a nice range of different artists here. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about how you got involved in what you're doing right now in the first place? Was it you know, a childhood dream, or did you suddenly wake up in college and think, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life? <laughs> Whatever it is, let's talk a little bit about that. I could start. Um, well, I am a hidden K-pop stan. <laughs> um, while back, maybe when I was like in middle school and going into like high school, I was really active on Tumblr. I know, ancient, nobody <laughs> uses it anymore. But K-pop was a huge community on Tumblr, and people make beautiful graphic designs mm -hmm. of their favorite favorite k-pop idols and it's this entire community and it's this like really weird niche corner of the internet but there's so much art in it and i was just really drawn to it and so i started you know like ms paint painting stuff <laughs> you know with like my little cursor mm -hmm. um, but then i started learning adobe and you know all of the usual tools and I started creating my own stuff um, and yeah it's just kind of grown into this huge thing and now I really think of it as just like a really beautiful way to tell stories as I, I'm sure every creative you know would know it's just like creating art is another medium to, to creating narratives and producing stories so yeah that's how I got started. You love K-pop. I love K-pop I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I can draw, I mean, my, my path is just not what I was intending to mm -hmm. be. Um, I remember um, being a child and 
um, my father, uh, stepfather, had a VHS recording camera. And so my brother and I would just be bored. And so we uh, started picking up and playing with it. And we would like uh, just have our, his little figurine characters do like matchboxes. And uh, we would just do all kinds of silly creative uh, storytelling with the camera. And I just fell in love with it. Uh, I then, uh, in middle school, started attending an after-school program. Mm -hmm. but back then, it was called PCTV, Phillips Community Television, uh, which later merged into Intermedia Arts. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where they really like gave me some skills as a middle schooler to do like just picking up the camera and editing and all that stuff. You know, thinking of the storyboard and everything. Um, but then as I got to high school, uh, the high school age from 2009, 2012, um, I was undocumented. Um, I did not have legal status to be in this country. And so at that point, it was just kind of like heartbreaking to make the decision of like, what am I gonna do in college? Like, am I going to do something that's gonna like earn me a living or go for like film? you know, and I really wanted to go to film. Like I was looking at film schools in New York, but ultimately I did not have the support of parents or adults or career counselors who understood the complexity of my situation and knew how to support me. And so I ended up uh, deferring that dream from going to film school and I decided to go for like, I think political science and I ended up in community organizing and that's like a part of my journey that I love and an honor. But in 2020, like most of us, we had a, I had a deep realization that I was deeply, deeply burned out from the work and um, I was not fulfilling my life path. Um, so I quit my job, not having a clear plan of what I wanted to do next, but knowing that I needed to say yes to myself and say yes to that little girl who wanted to do films. And so I started researching uh, on Google and on Facebook, I, I saw an ad for SPNN calling for DocU uh, Fellowship, which gives um, adults who want to learn about filmmaking the tools and education and training that we need to, to do short documentaries. And so in 2021, I applied and I was a part of that cohort, uh, which was led by Jua Lee Grandi and my, the teaching artists were Tayel Medina Jimenez and uh, Aja. And it was just like, from there it was just like, yes, just keep saying yes. And like, it's so crazy, because a year and a half later, I've been a part of some deep, wonderful productions. And it's just like, I think that's how I measure my growth. It's just, have I learned something new about myself and the world and the people around me? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing, yeah. I think that's a very, like, common thread that runs through a lot of um, ch child of immigrants or you know first generation um, BIPOC creators there's this um, divide between do I choose my passion or do I choose something that's going to guarantee financial stability so it's definitely like a really um, hard hill to overcome but I'm glad that you found us and that you're you know out there creating and making a name for yourself um, Olu let's also talk a little bit about how you got involved in filmmaking and editing yeah yeah so I think it mostly started, my dad is, a, um, is an art professor at like UWS and he teaches art history. So in my house, like, there's a lot of like art everywhere. Like it was an environment that really nurtured like appre appreciation for like art. So that kind of made a lot of things more easy for me in terms of pursuing uh, like video and photography. But my dad, when I was like, uh, I just got into college, it was like, I could either like buy a phone or a camera, and I decided to just get like a this like really small like power shot camera, and I took that and I just started like taking a lot of pictures and just running around. And eventually, I didn't shoot for a while. And then when I went to college, um, uh, I was like, what, what do I want to learn? Do I want to like explore potentially this career or like arts, or should I like find something more stable? But I decided to just like do biology because like, like Nigerians and like Africans, it's like just being a doctor like that pathway is like really strong like that's what a lot of people like you get you, you're trained to like be a doctor type stuff so i, I kind of did that for a while and then eventually i, I kind of took a risk and i was like let me i changed 
my major and I added like a minor in arts and through that I was able to like do photography and like being like the photography building like the arts building talk to like all the artists and through that I just eventually started learning more and artists are just like really community-based people and they just kind of pull you in and then they just gradually teach you things and through that I just started learning more and more and more mm -hmm. and eventually I yeah, yeah I feel you on that I feel you on that I yeah. was also I was in a pre-med track, so I was going to like become a little doctor and everything, but you know, that wasn't my true passion, so I'm glad we have a really <laughs> there. Um, but going in the same route of that, like, what are some things that guides you, inspires you, or affirms you, or challenges the work that you're doing? I know you've already mentioned like, you know, the instance of being undocumented, of, um, not, of having like, the K-pop community like, being f affirming, um, and then having you know, your dad who's like, teaching art and so that's also affirming the stuff that you're doing but then also maybe wanting to be a doctor in order to kind of follow down that cultural um, route so what are the things that guides you inspires you but also um, challenges you in the work that you're doing I can start um, I think one thing for sure is this fear that I might tell stories the wrong way because mm -hmm. for so long all the stories mm -hmm. and narratives that you know, I'm, I've been exposed to are from, you know, are told by white people. And mm -hmm. a lot of that has, has shaped the way that I think about how to tell a story, right? And so for me, I realize now, like, you know, I'm just, yeah, designing something visual, but a lot of research and a lot of preparation goes into it. And so when I uh, am, am doing that graphic design, I have to constantly think about, like, okay, like, who's my audience? Mm -hmm. Have I done my research thoroughly? And is this the right way to tell it? Is this the right way to design this, you know, specific piece of um, art or whatnot. And so I think that that's a challenge that I have definitely come across. And it's definitely a learning curve. It's, you know, uh, you have to grow and you have to take risks and you have to do what feels comfortable to you. At least that's what I've done. I feel like I've, been, I've tried to um, create projects that are personal to me and feel like, um, feel like there are things that I can really understand. So for me, I try to, you know, make sure that I'm thoroughly prepared in everything that I do. And I think that's also something that, that's a challenge, but also a goal that I have is to make sure that when I do tell stories, I have, you know, all stakeholders and all audiences and people who might see this, that I have them considered um, when I'm making something. Mm -hmm. It's very important. I think research is very, very important in the art world. I've seen lots of instances where things have just been blandly ignored. So I'm glad you're being a very responsible graphic designer. Yeah. yeah, something that guides and challenges me is just including as many people as, as I can in like the creative process, just getting people's perspectives and opinions. It was like, naturally I'm like very introverted. So when I make something, I like to just do it by myself in my room and just like finish it and just release it. But over time, I'm like, oh, I should, it makes more sense to work with people. Some mm -hmm. people might want to learn. I might want to learn from them. So trying to create as much community and include people and have people include me and have that feedback, that's something that really challenges me. And also, like, sharing information is something really big. Like, as an artist, sometimes it feels really competitive. Where it's like, oh, I know how to do this thing, but I'm not going to tell anybody. Or oh. So sometimes it feels really competitive because... Sometimes there's limited resources, so something that challenges me is also just being like, oh, this is very specific information. I'm, I'm just going to share it as much as possible. If you want to know how I edited this video, this is how I did it. Like trying to be as open as possible with the process and like my resources and the way I learned something, just that's something I have to keep doing because yeah, naturally it's like I'm just going to have a one track, just keep going, but it's like there's just so many other people. and. Because I feel like everybody can do, like, can be an artist. It's just mm -hmm. if, like, the right trajectory kind of meets up. That's when it's like, oh, boom, now you're doing it. So just giving people as many opportunities to be able to pursue that goal of creativity. It's something that I have to always think about. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, such a deep and important question. And I hear what you're saying, both of you, in terms of, like, uh, community being such an important part, like integral part of the process. Um, and one thing that challenges me is my inner self-doubt and just kind of like, will I honor this person the best way that I can? Is this going to be like 
Is this going to offend anybody? Is this going to be disrespectful to somebody? You know, like thinking through those cultural nuances. But I think it, in a way, it's almost like no disrespect, but just don't do what, what has been done, like with white media and the white mainstream and center myself in my community and my cultural background and know that I am approaching new cultures and new topics and new people from a, a place of respect. And my, my job is to ask. And I think that also is one of the challenges uh, because uh, I'm coming from priding myself in my early 20s of being an independent woman and do it all. And like, I'm a very prideful person. But when it comes to art, I realize that I'm limited by what I can do. And because I'm such at a young stage in my career, where there's a lot that I still don't know how to do. So how can I open up myself to ask for help and allow myself to be supported? Uh, because we're not, it's a teamwork. It's a team sport, basically, a lot of ways art making is. And so we're only strong as our, as, as our weaknesses, really. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like been a humbling experience to just also put ego and pride aside and be like, okay, yeah, no, I, I need help. Like, <laughs> I can't and I shouldn't carry this all by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's like, that's also what inspires and centers me is my people and just like my cultural background where I come from Mexican people who are very given and generous and community centered and we just like do things together like I just I'm inspired every time I go to a quinceañera or a community festival Cinco de Mayo every you know all these things because I realize like we are just natural artists like you don't have to go to school and get a diploma to say that you're an artist. Um, and it's my job to open up, to not be a gatekeeper and to just spread these opportunities as much as possible because someone out there might be considering artistry and it's not my job to decide whether they should go for it or not. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, totally, greatly said. Um, I um, think art making itself takes a lot of vulnerability and just allowing yourself to make mistakes and to ask for help. So I think that's definitely very important. I think especially as artists of colors living in a space that's very white and racialized, mm. um, oftentimes imposter syndrome is like at the forefront of us. And mm -hmm. although we're trying to make art, that imposter syndrome is there and it can often become a big block in our career. So it's definitely important to you know talk about these types of things and to allow yourself to be vulnerable and ask for help. Um, was it? I think that something I learned that I wish I learned sooner was that asking for help isn't giving up, it's mm -hmm. uh, being strong mm -hmm. because you're not giving up on the goal that you're trying to reach. And I really think that's really important for people to have support in this community because as a person of color, it's really hard to find a support system in a very you know, like judgmental um, like community and like it's great to have support from other people mm -hmm. so what are the best experiences you've had in your art journey so far you can take some time <laughs> to see <laughs> cool. I think to piggyback off of conversations of collaborating with other people and networking and having these resources around you. That's something that I, I love getting to do when I collaborate with someone is hearing their own like you know artistic expertise even if they're not a graphic designer that might be a photographer or a filmmaker or you know a copywriter you know they have like these visions in their heads and for me I love to bring those visions to life mm -hmm. and so when I collaborate with people it's just amazing because it's like you get to see someone else work and I also feel like in doing so, you also come up with solutions that, come up with solutions or strategies or art that you didn't think you could have done before mm -hmm. if you had done it by yourself. And so similar to you know asking for help and working with other people, I feel like that's been some of the most meaningful, um, you know, some of the most meaningful experiences in my life have been from working with others. Um, I can name like, uh, 
I worked on this magazine called Spaces Magazine when I was in college, and it was a magazine um, for BIPOC students, made by BIPOC students, and um, it was just, yeah, it was really cool because you don't realize how artsy everyone is, <laughs> um, but it's just like hearing their artistic intellect, so to say, I felt like that was something that was really cool. Um, and it's definitely also such like a, I feel like I hold um, collaboration with collaboration with other BIPOC artists, I hold that really close to my heart too because I feel like we view the world really differently as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that would be my response. <laughs> you go next. Mm -hmm. I say like the most rewarding experiences, yeah, it really includes just like working with people and how that kind of leads to other opportunities. Like there was this person when I, when I was in Eau Claire where I was trying to like shoot a music video and I never shot one before. And they just like randomly, they're like, oh yeah, you can shoot one for me. And then they like gave me like 300 bucks and then we like bought a bunch of props. And the music video wasn't that good, but <laughs> through that opportunity, they like emailed me another ex opportunity to like shoot a really, a, sh a documentary. So essentially you just apply and if they like your proposal, they give you money. So I applied and through the email that they sent me, I got another opportunity and then through that, I was able to like create this documentary about essentially my friends. It was a small African community in Eau Claire. And through that, that kind of led to more things. And I feel like that's one of the most rewarding aspects where like there's just a community-based thing around creativity, how people just want to help you. And they'll give like they'll push you to the next step and to the next step. And then you don't know what's gonna happen next. You might end up in a room like like the, two weeks ago, I was like working with my friend. He was shooting a documentary about like Mexican chefs in Minnesota, and I was just in a room, and there was like free food everywhere, and like I was meeting new people. And I was like, how would I even end up in this room, like, without like community and being a creative? Like, arts just kind of takes you places, and then you meet new people, and it just makes the world like big, and everything is just connected. You're like, oh wow, why, why am I here now? I'm just talking to this new person, just because I have a camera, or so. I feel like that's something that. Is very rewarding. Is, did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I take okay. you places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I I've, I've had um, I recently completed a project uh, doing a camera operator for a documentary about the making of Sikala Shah opera, uh, which was produced by an opera theater house. And uh, through this documentary, uh, we uh, were document, well, it was kind of like um, it's art within art. So I was brought on to the project by Sequoia Hawk, who's an indigenous filmmaker and Jerome Fellow of this year, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I also met them through SPNN when I did the program Spotlight Series uh, last winter. Uh, and so I, um, I'm Mexican, but I also have like a mixed racial identity where I do have uh, indigenous Mexica roots. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of my work right now is uncovering my people's stories and traditions through a decolonization lens. And so I was, first of all, just kind of like blown away that Sequoia would ask me to like work on this project with them. Um, which was honoring Sikala Shah, a Lakota uh, opera writer who wrote the Sundance Opera, and her work was co-opted by her white male professor. Mm -hmm. So she was largely erased from the books. And so this documentary was centering her life through a modern, like what modern Lakota, Nakota women are today. And so we went, uh, for one of the film days, we went down to Prairie Island, which is in southeast Minnesota, uh, to meet up with one of the talent, the actresses and singers. And uh, she invited us to a farm that herds the first native-owned buffalo herd in Minnesota. And we got to see the buffalo herd like just live in the prairie mm. as they should have been and existing in the way that they haven't been able to exist for hundreds, almost hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And so 
for this to happen in the moments that we're seeing a renaissance of indigenous filmmaking, it was a very powerful moment and it reminds me of the story of the seven generation, um, which I don't think I can speak to, but it's just, it's a huge honor to be able to work with collaborators and artists who are not the same cultural background as me because I feel like I can understand myself, the world, and each other in the way that I wouldn't without art. Yeah, yeah, art making is so powerful. It connects us to the communities around us, but also to ourselves and those who are already in our circles and those outside of our circles. So mm -hmm. definitely a lot of great experiences that you guys have been having. Um, I hope that as you continue being artists, you get more and more great experiences. Um, but to that, let's also talk about some difficulties that you guys have had as artists. Um, I know we've already touched base on some of them, but I think um, centering the question more on difficulties specifically due to the space that you're in, whether that's like Minnesota is too cold and so I can't film what I want to do, <laughs> or you know, like there's a lack of certain communities that I can't get in touch with due to blah, blah, blah. But let's talk a little bit about those difficulties. I think in general, I can point to one difficulty for sure I always deal with is um, getting paid for mm -hmm. the value that you bring to a project. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that goes for artists in general, especially emerging artists though, I think, when you're just starting out, you know, like me, for example, fresh out of college and trying to figure it all out. I'm like, when I did my first freelance project, I was like, okay, how much, like, what's my pricing gonna be like? Like, you know, I have to sell myself, you know, as someone who brings not just design but someone who brings my expertise and my creative knowledge and all of that to a project and I feel like that can be a very difficult moment because you start to have self-doubts like mm. am I no better than like Canva or an AI generator <laughs> you know those AI generators are so powerful these days and I really have to think about okay like when I'm designing something I really have to step it up and show why I'm show why I'm unique and why I'm deserving of you know creating a project for someone because that's that's a lot of what graphic design is is creating work for other people right and so um, what I've struggled with is making sure that when I do begin a project I'm actually getting paid um, properly because I think a lot of people tend to undervalue artists or tend to think like oh yeah they're just creating this thing I could slap an it's image and some hobby. text and some colors <laughs> together right but um, for me, I'm like, okay, if you could do that, then don't come to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's something I definitely struggle with is making sure that I actually um, get paid. And not just by other people though, like making sure I know how much I'm worth mm. um, mm -hmm. too, because there have definitely been times where I'm like, yeah, I'll just do that for like a couple bucks. And it takes me 80 hours to work on it, but I only got like 70 bucks or 80 mm. bucks for it, right? But when you think about it, artists usually get like, artists usually get paid like $40 an hour. And so you always have to do that like mental math. And it's just the reality of it. I think in my ideal environment, I would love it if everything was free and accessible. And if it wasn't so competitive, then everyone could just share all their artwork mm -hmm, and their mm -hmm. knowledge. I would love for that. I think that's, that's why I'm always like, um, I always root for, um, you know, like having things open for free. Like I would love all the art galleries in the world were, were free. I'd love to see everyone's art, you know, for free. Like, and I like to share my own things for free too, but obviously that's not realistic. So um, that's why I, I go back to the, you know, if everything can't be for free, I would love <laughs> if people can pay me properly so that I can do more things, um, so that I can create more things that might be more accessible mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is actually an anti-capitalism panel, just so you guys are aware. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, we gotta live in this capitalistic world and make art. But yeah, Olu and Nia. Um, so yeah, a challenge. Um, yeah, I say like some of the challenges, um, there's so many opportunities and resources which I've, I've been really grateful for. Like coming from Wisconsin, I felt like there were like a lot of programs like SVNN or like uh, Film North. But coming here to Minnesota, I feel like there's a lot of things that like uplifting artists. Um, so yeah, the biggest challenge is overall, it's, it might just be societal, just like a lack of appreciation for like arts and like, as, just like creative arts in general. Like I feel like, cause like arts is like something that really like shapes culture, like 
when you go home on your phone, you listen to music, you're on your TV, like somebody designed this table, someone designed like this carpet. Like arts is a big structure of society. Like it's something that really uplifts society, like language, like words people use, like, oh, you use that word, it's from a song, somebody wrote that, so now you're using it every day. Like arts is something that just, it links with everything in our lives, but at the same time, people don't appreciate it. They're like, yeah, it's, and honestly, sometimes it feels like a more of like a colonial perspective, mm, mm. like coming from like Nigeria, like from a West African perspective, like arts is just something that's just part of everyday life and it's mm. something that's really appreciated. And it's deeply rooted with like spirituality and culture. And I feel like out here it's more, um, if you can't make money from something, it's not valuable mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's, that's a big thing that kind of plays in my head where I'm like, am I doing this because I'm gonna make a ton of money from it? Or am I doing this because it's something that is fulfills me and will inspire people and it provides and maybe it challenges people or challenges me. Sometimes I'm torn between like money and creating. I don't, I don't know, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of a ramble, but that's a, something that challenges me. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I think all of us feel that. So tonight we're gonna leave this place and be anti-capitalist so that we can all create <laughs> art. <laughs> but yeah, Nia, go ahead and share. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll try my best. I think going off of what you're saying, I think figuring out that number, right? Like what's my hourly pay? Like I still struggle with that. And it's not an easy like number. It's not a, like a definite, this is it. Uh, because also gotta honor like where people, my other collaborators and clients might be at as well. And the racial, gender, socioeconomic, gen like spectrum really. Um, but I agree with what you're saying, Olu. Like, I think um, like we're just living in a country that is like, like art is a commodity and is uh, largely driven by consumerism. So at that point, like art is going to depreciate itself in a way that um, makes us as creators on the like labor aspect of it, like constant, constantly overworked and constantly burned out because we're just trying to keep up with inflation, we're just trying to keep up with uh, new software and technologies, and yet um, it's, it's a tricky balance living in Minnesota because we're like, right, the land of 10,000 nonprofits, and at least 90 of those, 9,000 of those are arts. Like, <laughs> so clearly there's some type of societal structure for arts. Clearly as a state, we care for the arts. I mean, the Clean Water and Legacy Fund provides so much funding for public art, uh, but without it, it's also really hard to exist. And so I found that uh, when I'm applying for grants, uh, especially on one uh, application with, I, which I co-wrote with my partner who is a playwright and um, we listened to the panel discussion on this, and some of the questions that were coming up for the panel who was largely white, largely hetero, and cisgender, uh, were rather like death tone. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just like some comments that would have clearly been addressed through the application process itself, but because they did not have the time as a panel to really clearly like read through it, those questions then became uh, a self, like uh, it was then a, a burden on my partner to prove how well he could articulate the proposal mm -hmm. when the proposal was laid out clearly. Um, so it's just, it's a weird dynamic right now. I don't think there's an easy answer. It seems like uh, the Netflix model the Hulu model is also not working out. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, there's great, there's stories coming out of it, but, and it's someone art, it's someone work, but that's not also profitable for them. So it's kind of like, we're just trying to figure out new models of existing and creating art that pays us our worth, but also it's not inaccessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. I think we need to do better as a community for making arts more accessible to our young folks, but also to folks who are older and wanting to make art for the first time and not being so gatekeepy around these types of things. You know, for example, like grants, like there's so much work that goes into writing a proposal for a grant and there's 
a lot of um, language barriers within that too because mm -hmm. grant um, givers are looking for a specific language that you need to use in your um, application mm -hmm. and all that. So definitely a lot of challenges, but I'm sure you guys have um, grown a lot through those too. So, so uh, what I find, uh, actually never mind. Uh, <laughs> so I was wondering, uh, how do you guys measure growth in your work? I think I measure growth uh, just kind of by, have I learned something new? Have I learned a new skill? But also have I learned something new about myself and others? Um, and I know it's very, <laughs> it's not like a tangible thing that you can measure. Uh, I don't operate in those those metrics type of ways but yeah just really like have I learned to if I walk from a project and I learn a little bit more about my own humanity and humanity of others then I think I'm growing yeah, yeah I mean I look back at my old design projects and I'm like some of them I'm like that, that's horrible <laughs> like why did I ever do that that's <laughs> awful you know god awful but there are some too where I look back and I'm like why don't I do that anymore? Mm -hmm. You know, like I used to really enjoy doing X, Y, and Z, and I used to do this kind of design. Why don't I do that anymore? And so, um, I think for me, I to measure growth. I mean, it's a tough question, but I would say that if I can constantly be working on something that I actually enjoy mm -hmm. and just do for myself and for nobody else, I think that I would count that as growing. Um, mm -hmm. And se secondary to that. I would agree that you know if I'm not learning something new, then that's also not growing. Um, and I always try to make sure that you know if I'm doing something, I'm not doing it like constant. I mean, that's a lot of design work is yeah, you're doing something over and over again. That's a lot of the tasks that you get actually is doing something that you're very familiar with, familiar with, and you're doing it over and over again. It gets really tedious, right? But um, I also always hope to work on new projects and learn new things and learn from other people too. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess kind of two sides to that, to that answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say I measure growth, whether it's through like technical things, like, oh, I learned how to use this camera. Um, <laughs> I learned how to do this particular effect. Mm -hmm. And also in ways of overcoming like challenges, whether it's like, oh, I, I was able to shoot this first project or um, I was able to like reach out to this person, like um, just like overcoming like thoughts in your head and be like, oh, I was able to move past this. And I feel like that's how I kind of, oh. and also looking back on your work and being like, oh wow, I, I thought I was the best <laughs> and now this is really bad. I, I really grew a lot. Like I even look back stuff like a year ago, I'm like, wow, that was bad. Damn, I thought I was good a year ago. <laughs> so um, yeah, I suppose looking back and seeing how far you've gone is also a way of seeing how far you're growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked a lot about, you know, the difficulties, but also, you know, the rewards of art making. Um, I think to bring that together, how do you envision the Twin Cities or just the Minnesota creative community to be like in order to have a space that's most supportive and that allows you to thrive? So how do you envision the community being in order for you as artists to thrive? Maybe it's because I'm coming from a community organizer background, but I just feel like we should just have guaranteed income for artists. Mm -hmm. um, I think St. Paul tried a pilot program where it was uh, like $500 a month. Uh, and of course, like $500 is not gonna pay your rent or mortgage, but imagine if we had that for everybody mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that considered themselves an artist. Um, that would be a huge cushion. Um, and I mean, I think I just want to see more like cross pollination, cross collaboration. Like I think uh, the community that I've met so far here in Minnesota is generous and kind and giving, uh, but somehow we're still like stuck in silos sometimes mm -hmm. by our cultural identities or our racial gender identities too. So it's just like the we we stop winning w when we stop talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Like we stop growing when we are not having critical conversations or collaborating. And so um, I'm just really proud of the Minnesota artist community. Um, 
and I hope that we can bring back the renaissance that we had uh, because we've been known to be a state that supports artists. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. a guaranteed income will be a great yeah, place I to start. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is something me and my friends always talk about. Like, a lot of my friends, like, some of them make music, some of them are like videographers, and they're always talking about like, Minnesota is like the next spot. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's just like a teenager, like when you're young, <laughs> right. you're like, this is the spot, yeah. this is the next New York or something. Yeah. But we always talk about that, like what, what yeah. it will take like artists to the next, take this whole city to the next level. Yeah. And yeah, honestly, I, I never really thought about like structurally, and you mentioned that, like something on a legislative level mm -hmm. that actually like supports artists. Like I, I know it's like so many musicians who make like the best music ever, but they work mm -hmm. so much and then they have to work extra when they go home to release music. Like a, a lot of the people I know who work in arts, just they can't really do it sustainably. Mm -hmm. And some people can do it sustainably, but it's really competitive. Like, it's like one in like a hundred yeah. who maybe you get a grant. So a way where like everybody can have mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and yeah, that, that might just be that, like an uh, income for artists. I'm gonna mm -hmm. start signing people up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk to the tonight, everybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, honestly, same wavelength here. I think just, I agree that there needs to be some more support for artists and Yes, sometimes we are starving artists, and I hate that. You know, I don't want to eat ramen every night. <laughs> but um, yeah, guaranteed income that would be great. I think also it's like there are so many projects that someone would want to take on, but they they can't. It's a it's a great project. It's a beautiful vision, but they can't because they, it can't sustain them. You know, mm -hmm. there's not enough money in it. Um, and so I feel like there's so many missed opportunities just because there's not enough financial support for artists. Um, and I don't know how to like revise the structure <laughs> or the system, but yeah, if there's something, if there's a way, I would love for that. I think also, uh, maybe I just, maybe it's just me, I haven't in, that had been involved enough in the community yet um, after college, but I think too, just like exposure for artists too. Um, like this is a really cool opportunity for emerging artists, like getting to meet and network with, with other artists, I think is super cool. And that, that's something that I would love to do um, or have more of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you go, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I was, I was just going to say also, like, yeah, having, like, really young people involved in the arts, like, mm -hmm. everybody here, this is yes. essentially, like, you ran, like, that's, uh, like, these people in, like, two, three years, like, they might be, like, the best, like, director, writers, like, having a pathway that kind of, like, projects you mm -hmm. into the arts, like, it's really hard to find that, and these people are already on the path, so, like, things like this is, like, a big step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that so. structural support is very, 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 very important. <laughs> um, I think we are getting better at it, but for sure, like there are, there's still so much work to be done. Mm -hmm. And they, I think it's difficult to ask like three artists and be like, "What do we need to do?" You know, it needs to be a whole. We have to have a holistic approach to it, and we have to have so much more conversations and bring so many people into it. But the more people you bring into it, you know, the more opinions that you have. And so for us, we might be like, we would want like, you know, a stipend every month for artists, but then if you bring more voices into it, you know, different opinions will come up. And so I think that's why it's so hard to have something um, on, to have a structure for it, um, legislatively or like just in general, um, just because there's so many different thoughts that people have regarding like, how do we sustain artists and what is artist, what, what's an artist worth? But maybe you can go ahead. I think the SPNN Youth Program was like was a great start for um, for me and my friends who wanted to sign up because uh, me as an artist myself, I was really looking for like opportunities is to like like help me explore my artistic side because I remember searching online like trying to find like different like maybe like online classes or like trying to find maybe like a program to maybe help me with like maybe my music career and then I remember my journalism teacher um, brought my in <laughs> and um, there you guys were talking about SPNN and then I heard something about music production and then I was like really intrigued by that and then I'm I'm here. <laughs> I'm here uh, helping co-host like an artist panel, mm. and I think that's really great. And then it was a great opportunity for me, and then f for my friends who are also in this program. And I think Minnesota and like St. Paul is like a great place for artists too. 
I, I would love <laughs> also like a, a paid thing for artists who are trying to like emerge from the darkness and depths of our basements. <laughs> and like, I feel like Minnesota is a great artistic community and like, it's like, li like Lizzo. Lizzo, uh, mm -hmm. when she was first starting out, um, people said that she should go to St. Paul, Minnesota, and then, and she was like really hesitant about it. But then like, she kept going to all these like ba basement shows or like these concerts, and she kept asking these artists like where they were from. They all said St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And then so that's what made her come here. And look where she is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Minnesota is home to like a lot of really great artists. You know, once you actually take a step back and look at it, there are really amazing artists who have made their mark in society that started here in St. Paul or Minneapolis. So, you know, I think you guys are all in a good space right now. But for sure, we can do more work in creating a structure that will actually support and sustain all of our artists. Um. So, um, in the future, what projects do you want to work on, and like, what are your plans? <laughs> Dream no, big, you guys. No plans, just vibes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just go with the flow. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's hard to envision. It's. I'll be honest. It's really hard to envision because um, I don't want to go after the awards. I don't want to mm -hmm. go after the recognition of the industry. I mean, that's great. Um, but I just hope to continue telling stories that are of the times, and. Um, I am positioning myself to apply for the Jerome Fellowship mm -hmm. in the next two years. I'll apply next year. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll get it, but I'll apply again and again and again um, until it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, I hope to uh, submit my work to festivals and just see what that is about, um, not just for my art to be seen in Minnesota, but outside of it as well. Um, and I, I just hope to keep directing and writing and producing um, and helping out the homies, helping out the crew <laughs> get their works done. And you know, it's just such an amazing thing to do. Like when you're friends with artists, it's like, all right, let's get this done, buddy. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> even mm -hmm. if you don't, it, it just comes back to you, that energy that you give to others, it comes back to you. And sometimes when I feel like I'm having self doubt or, um, Ek, whatever, ekis. Uh, it's just like the energy that it just comes back to me. My friend's just like, okay, but how? what can I help with? How can we do this? How can we break it down? Mm -hmm. And just like, okay, okay. If I can get to a point as a career, uh, in a career as an artist where I don't need people, then I don't know if I'm really doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I want to revise some of the projects that you work on, actually. That's mm -hmm. the one. And then secondly, um, so much of art is digital these days, mm -hmm. especially graphic design. Everything's digital, right? But I've really been interested recently in like printed published materials again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because that, that kind of medium is different. It's like mm -hmm. a different way to interact with the art. And so mm -hmm. I've been interested in, you know, wondering how I can do more design that is on like poster boards and billboards and banners and those printed things, it's different. And I kind of am interested in that. And then finally, what I'm actually, what I would really love to do, especially given the community that we have um, with so many, you know, Hmong folks in St. Paul and, and in Minneapolis and Minnesota in general, mm -hmm. I really want to help uh, Hmong businesses mm -hmm. uh, in particular. There are so many, so many wonderful mm -hmm. Hmong businesses that are just you know, just starting up, or they've, they've been here for years, but they just need a little bit of, a, you know, graphic designers, you know, <laughs> magic, right? And I feel like, mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I specifically like to do like branding and stuff like that. So literally, you know, selling your, selling your visual image, right? And so um, I feel like there's so much potential to help Hmong businesses. And that's something that I would really, really want to do is collaborate more with people and just help them take, take it to the next level. Because I feel like, um, for example, like I know so many um, hairdressers and salons owned by Hmong, Hmong people, and it's like they do amazing work, but the exposure that they get is mm -hmm. just um, not as great because mm -hmm. you know some of their visuals that you know really help to sell their business is just not it's just not there yet, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I really want to do is really help um, the businesses in the community. Mm -hmm.
That was really awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, for me, in like five to ten years, man. My ultimate goal is like just have like a small like media house, whether in like hopefully like in Nigeria. Just have like a yeah, I really want to go back home and just kind of get back into I don't know like where I used to live, where my grandma used to live. Have like a media house there where I can maybe shoot like really small projects, maybe like short films, maybe like documentaries, and also have like outreach programs. Because mm -hmm. I feel like the way the reason why I'm like so interested in video and photography is because I moved from Nigeria to America and it's like just uh, being able to like give back because I'm a very lucky individual so like being able to like find a way to like develop like a structure maybe it's like uh, oh this kid can rent cameras from this media house or we have like classes or workshops I feel like that's my ultimate goal just mm -hmm. have like a, a building just have a bunch of cameras have a studio and then I don't know and yeah. the community people can come in and out and like a CNN yeah, like that's yes. it. Yeah, we just move move this to Nigeria. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Essentially, I don't know, we gotta ask our ED. Yeah, yeah, just branch out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's my ultimate goal. Yeah, yeah. So going along those lines, kind of the same question, but where do you see yourself in five years and in ten years? So setting those benchmarks, what do you hope to achieve in five years and in, in ten years and all that? I know it's far ahead, but you know, you can dream big. Envision something for yourself. I think in five years, I want to figure out my design style. Mm -hmm. I want to figure out what I'm really good at. Because right now, like just starting out, I tell people all the time, yeah, I can do like a bunch of different things. And part of that is like, I like to sell myself as capable of a variety of things because that's what makes money, you know? Um, but I really want to figure out something that I'm really, really good at because there's so many different sectors of graphic design. and. I feel like um, I really want to hone one or two or three different skills. And in five years, I want to be able to make money off of that. I want to mm -hmm. be able to say, hey, I'm really good at this. This is why you need me. And um, this is what I like. That's, I want to find my focus. Mm -hmm. I want to really narrow, narrow it down. I would say in 10 years, I hope to be freelancing full time mm -hmm. and not have to worry about Nine having five. a stable income, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. being able to be flexible and work on my own schedule and um, being able to say no to projects. That's something too I have a hard time because I'm like, I can't say no to this. This is like a money opportunity, right? Um, but I want to be able to pick and choose in 10 mm -hmm. years. I want to be able to um, have, that, have that privilege, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think uh, in five years, um, I would have want to um, finish working on a project about grief. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's one emotion that as society we're still grappling with since 2020. And I mean, it's a personal passion of mine as someone who, is a bereaved sister and I live with grief every day. Uh, my life has been transformed by that experience. Um, so to do a project that would shed light on how traditional Mexica practices and wisdom apply to how we cope with grief would mm -hmm. be amazing um, in five years. Um, in 10 years, I hope uh, I have completed my first feature film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what if it's going to be a short a documentary or a narrative, but I, I hope it's a well-funded piece. I hope there's structures. I hope in 10 years we have guaranteed mm -hmm. income for mm -hmm. artists. Mm -hmm. I hope I have figured out a funding model in which I can have many community producers, not just top dollar producers, but it's a community effort that people believe in this work and are pitching um, amounts of dollars. Um, I hope to have been able to work with and direct a crew of BIPOC queer women and trans and gender non-conforming people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm rooting for all of your dreams. <laughs> oh. Yeah, in five to 10 years. Yeah, right now I'm slowly branching into like documentaries, music videos and like some short film. So in five to ten years, I hope to. It's just like me and like my friends, and like two or three people. In five to ten years, I've been like working with like more people, especially working with people of color. It's also really nice when it's like, oh, um, it's like this person's mom, this person's like 
uh, Nigerian, having like that whole community. Um, so if I had 10 years, I have like somebody who's like gaffing, who's like lighting it, like a DP, maybe I'm just directing, um, or I'm just editing the video. Having like that st structural support system, where, like people can just help with like a short film or a documentary. I feel like that's something I want to see in five to 10 years. That would mm -hmm. be awesome. Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Benny, where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Oh, me? Yes, Benny. Oh, um, well, in five years, um, I'm obviously I'm going to be out of high school, but uh, <laughs> I want to, I want to go to college in Europe. I want to go to Florence mm -hmm. and study the art there. I want to go see different parts of the world, uh, hear like different cultures. It's, is music and cultures and all the different arts they have to offer. Um, I want to play for crowds. Mm -hmm. I want to play at music festivals. Mm -hmm. I I want to maybe start a band, mm -hmm. but I'm still m improving myself. And and in ten years, I want to see myself on the cover of a magazine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who oh, will be designing it? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, be a circle back. Call us for the video, yes. the music video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can do it. Yeah, we, we direct it. Yeah. Yeah. And I also want to see all your guys' work too. Because I'm really interested. Yeah. In 10 years, we'll have a reunion. Bring everybody <laughs> back. Yeah. Yeah. Where so are you guys sorry. at now? <laughs> With more gray hairs, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Not me though, I don't age. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably be bald. <laughs> just kidding. All right, well, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, I'm going to open it up for any questions, but let's have a round of applause for our amazing artists who joined us thank tonight. Thank you, camera.